message today is death by my side, embracing death and the fruit of belief in the resurrection. And so this message I've been wanting to do for a while. Uh, I What I've seen in the Word of God is that there's multiple examples of people accomplishing a lot for God, and they accomplish that with a embrace, with an embrace of death, that that is just a consequence of obeying God sometimes. And they don't run away from it. They're not scared of it. They don't fear it. They just embrace it as part of, you know, uh, a side effect of, of serving God. That's just something that is going to happen one day. And they're, they don't let that hinder them obeying God and, and stepping out in faith and trying to do something for God. They don't let the possibility of death hinder them from doing anything. And I think that's such an important uh, concept to get down. You see there's many aspects to this as we go through many scriptures. But you're going to see how important this is uh, at any time in history, right, for Christianity. But especially now, it's going to become even more important. So I hope that everyone takes this to heart and sees the, important of it, the importance of it. And uh, just going to give you a couple examples, actually, from my life in uh, doing street ministry and stuff. I've seen this happen multiple times where someone was trying to intimidate me and scare me, threaten me. And when I told them, basically, hey, you're just going to have to kill me right here. Just shoot me in the head, and that's the only way you're going to stop me. I'm not going to stop preaching. And then all of a sudden, their countenance would completely change. Their face changed in front of me, and they stopped trying to you know, act like that and, and tried to intimidate me. Because once they see that you're not afraid of death and you're willing to go all the way uh, to that point— they, it basically takes the wind out of their sails. And that doesn't happen, you know, it's not going to happen every time. I mean, obviously many Christians have been killed for their faith. But it does uh, happen with many different people when they're trying to, you know, because a lot of people are just trying to, to scare. And also, not just that, it's also a test too. Because think about it like this. There's a lot of, you know, fake Christianity, fake Christians today and so a lot of times what they see is fake and, and that people will fold or act weird or maybe act in the flesh. And, and, they, and people have seen that if they provoke people enough or try to intimidate them that they'll back down, they'll fold or they'll act you know, weird in the flesh. And so they keep pushing and pushing and pushing, see if they can break you or, or scare you. But once they see something that, that's real and genuine, it's shocking to them, kind of takes them aback. But that's a good thing, and then it's gonna maybe it'll make them, uh, you know, think about the word of God more seriously. Uh, like I said, I had this happen to me multiple times. I had this happen one time. I don't think I, I don't know if I told you guys, but I went out one time street preaching in uh, San Antonio. I came back really late through a bad neighborhood at past midnight. I was in a parking lot by myself, coming back to the car. I'm going to get in the car. I turn to my side. All of a sudden, there's this huge black dude standing there waving me down, and you know, I'm by myself, no one else around, no one in the parking lot, just me and him. And he's like, hey, <laughs> and he he lifts his shirt up and says, oh, I don't have any guns, man. I don't have any weapons. He puts his hands up. And so just quickly, I got up and I walked pretty fast over to him. I said, what's up, man? I was just over here preaching the word of God. And I don't know what he was planning on doing because he was talking about asking for money and stuff. But... You could just see it in his eyes as soon as I talked about that, that he was like, he, he kind of softened, he chilled out a little bit, his shoulders dropped. Um, I think I had a little bit of cash on me, not much. I gave him what I had, but it wasn't, it wasn't that much. And I just started talking to him about that a little bit. He, and uh, then, you know, after talking for a few minutes with him, shook his hand and he left. But who knows what his intentions were? I mean... You know, if someone's coming up to you after midnight in a parking lot and you're by yourself, it's usually not good. <laughs> it's usually not good. And they're talking about money and stuff. So, um, but the point is, is that, is that when you show that you don't, you're not scared and you're not scared of, of death, it can open a lot of doors. You, doors that you wouldn't expect would open. 
and uh, people let their guard down too. Some really rough people. So, anyways, that's just a, a side note about this. But I want to get into the notes here. Get into this message. We've got a bunch of scriptures to go through here. All right. So, first of all, I want to say this message is not about loving death, right? We we're talking about death by my side, embracing death. That doesn't mean we're talking about loving death. Uh, absolutely not. Proverbs 8.36 says, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Okay? This scripture talks about people that hate God love death. Okay? Absolutely. That is a, that is a fact of scripture. But what does that mean? Loving death is glorifying death. Loving death is loving destruction, pain, and suffering. Loving death is loving darkness, which we can see today in the many tattoos, shirt designs, and decorations that depicts things related to death. You see that everywhere, right? Everything covered in skulls and grim reapers and, and, and you know killing and death and all these things. People put it on their bodies. They decorate their bedrooms with it. You know, they think it looks cool, but it, what is it? It's a celebration of death. And that's, yeah, that's glorifying death. And yes, that when it says, all they that hate me love death, it's talking about these types of things. And it's people like, you know, being obsessed with, uh, you know, murder and all these other things, serial killers and all the, those other types of things. Just obsessed with it. That's not what I'm talking about here in this message. This message is about embracing the reality that if we will do anything for Christ, we must face death and not run away. That's what I'm talking about here today. Everyone who accomplished much in the service of God embraced death. I'm not just talking about the old, uh, the New Testament. I'm talking about oh, the Old Testament too. Everyone accomplished much in the service of God embraced death, including Paul, David, and the Lord Jesus Christ as our ultimate example. Jesus is the ultimate example. We'll be talking about him at the end. But we're going to look at some other examples. In the Bible, they all embraced death and they accomplished much for God. And let's look at this scripture to open up. And I want to break down this passage because... I think we may have had a slight misunderstanding about the primary meaning of this passage, but I want to show you what this is talking about here, and we'll jump off from this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 30, And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Okay. So what I've heard uh, many times throughout the years of listening to preaching is preachers quote that scripture where uh, it says, I die daily in reference to, you know, a, die, a daily dying to self, right? dying to the, the lust of the flesh and these types of things. Now, I do believe that, you know, that is a truth of Scripture. Absolutely, I will never deny that. But I think it's in this passage, that's not what it's referring to. And I'm going to show you why. The phrase, I die daily, is often applied spiritually, as in dying to self. But if this passage is examined in context, it does not appear to be the primary meaning. This doesn't mean the Bible doesn't talk about death in the context in the context of the flesh. It definitely does. Absolutely, the Bible says that. I would never deny that. And here, here's some scriptures about that. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Right? Mortify, that is a word that has to do with death. Putting something to death. Mortification. Right? Mortify the deeds of the body. Colossians 3, 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And then Romans 6, 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Okay? So mortify the deeds of the body, mortify your members, and be dead unto sin. Right? So, yes, the Bible talks about death, 
in relation to the flesh, the lust of the flesh. Um, yes, absolutely says that. I would never deny that. But when Paul said, I die daily, he was talking about the possibility of facing death every day, the potential that he could be killed, which he uh, had that, you know, he was involved in situations like that all the time. If you just read, especially through the book of Acts, but he talks about it over and over again, uh, facing death. In the same passage, Paul talks about facing the possibility of death from wild beasts, right? Look, look at what he says there. If after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. Now, sometimes some you know commentators are like, well, maybe he was referring to men that were like beasts and all this stuff. I don't see a reason why we should uh, spiritualize that and say that he's talking about that. He says, I fought with beasts. And that was actually a custom in the time of the Roman Empire to have criminals fight wild beasts as a spectacle for a large crowd. Now, depending on what the person did, sometimes they just throw them in there with no weapons, sometimes a sword and a shield, but they would have to fight beasts. And we know from, you know, instances in the Old Testament, like Daniel, he was put into the lion's den and God shut the mouth of the lion so that he wasn't eaten. So God could take care of him. And obviously God saved Paul's life. But he's saying, you know, the point is, is that when he says fought with beasts at Ephesus, the, he, the context is talking about facing death. Okay? In the context of that situation, facing death, Paul asks, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Right? How does this give me an advantage if the dead don't rise, if there's no resurrection? Why would I put my life in, in danger? Why would he risk his life if there was no resurrection? doesn't make sense. And so his willingness, his willingness to face death is a fruit of his belief in the resurrection of the dead. The belief in the resurrection of the dead helped Paul face death without fear. Paul contrasts this attitude with the statement, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Why does he say that? Well, that's a quote from the Old Testament, first of all. Uh, Isaiah 22, verse 12. And in that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. And behold, instead, what happened? Joy and gladness, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating flesh, drinking wine. And what they say? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we shall die. That's the attitude that the people had. That's what Paul was quoting. And so what is he talking about? This attitude is one that people have when they treat this life as if that's all there is. They have no thought of a resurrection or day of judgment, which the Bible warns all people on earth about. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. You die once, and then there is a day of judgment. You will stand before God to be judged. Now, if you don't think that that's going to happen, if you've lied to yourself and you don't think that you're going to die one day and then be judged, well, then what's your attitude going to be? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we shall die. Let's live it up now. The only thing they're concerned about is enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season temporary pleasures of sin. This selfish mentality of parting until the day of death is opposed to the mentality of seeking to do the will of God, even if that means facing death. They are opposed. Two different contrary mentalities. The, the mentality of the majority of people today is living it up in this life the best that you can as far as pleasure goes until the day of your death because after death, who cares what happens after that? That is opposed to people that know that, hey, the pleasures of sin, they're only for a season. And, and I'm going to reject pursuing the temporary pleasures of sin. Instead, what I want to pursue is seeking to do the will of God. And I don't care if in the pursuance of seeking to do the will of God, 
I may face death. I may be killed for my faith. And you know what? I don't care. Because what's more important is doing the will of God. And that's the mentality of someone who is born again by the power of the Holy Spirit because they put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's the mentality that they're going to have. No hope of a resurrection leads to mindless hedonism, just self-indulgence. There was a band called that, right? There's a group, uh, Mindless Self-Indulgence. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's what no hope of a resurrection leads to. Type of mentality. And this is all summarized by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, okay? Talking about this mentality of... You know, how important the belief in the resurrection of the dead is and how it affects your conduct in this life. So let's look at it. Let's look at it right here. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen... Then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. It's all worthless for nothing if Christ didn't rise from the dead. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Remember, because there's over 500 witnesses of the resurrection of Christ. We are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not, if there's no such thing as a resurrection. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. Shows the importance of the resurrection of Christ, right? In relation to salvation, we talk about, you know, the suffering of Christ, the death of Christ. But what about the resurrection? It says, if there is no resurrection of Christ, you are yet in your sins and your faith is in vain. That's how important the resurrection of Christ is. The Bible says he was raised again for your justification. It proved that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he conquered death in that moment. Okay, we're going to talk more about that later. Then they also, which are, okay, if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, you're yet in your sins. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished, okay? He says, so if those people that were saved, the people that were in Christ, those that have died that were saved, well, they're just perished and and then nothing's going to happen in the future if there's no resurrection. So what's the point? And then verse 19, pay attention, this is important. He says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And that directly relates to this mentality of let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. If all we, if the hope in Christ that we have, if it's only in this life and there's no such thing as a resurrection of the dead, some will arise to eternal life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. If that's not going to happen, then what's the point? People might as well live it up. We are of all men most miserable. Why? Because why would you why would you be miserable? I'll tell you why. Because if there's no resurrection and they're suffering all these trials, including facing death, they're doing it for no reason. Because after they die, they will never, they won't exist after that. There's no resurrection. So why go through all the suffering? It's for no reason. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He is risen. He is risen. So let's make that clear. Christ is risen and therefore, he's saying, if Christ is risen, there will also be a future resurrection of the dead for the righteous which is the first resurrection and that should give us hope the resur- the belief in that resurrection and when you have faith in that and you know that that's going to happen that will give you hope and we'll see it takes away fear okay
But I wanted you to see how it's connected to that, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we shall die. It's the same thing when he's talking about we are of all men most miserable if this, is, if this life is all we have. All right, let's continue. Saints, a step away from death. Let's get into this. Paul was close to death many times in his life. Let's read it. He describes it right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. He's saying in deaths oft, often, many times, almost died. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. One time he was stoned so bad, everybody thought he was dead. They said he is dead. And then somehow, by the grace of God, he got up and walked away. So that, that was another instance of facing death. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Very close to death many times. Right? With the shipwrecks. When he went through the storm, Eurachlodon, everybody thought they were going to die. They said, all oh, they hadn't seen the stars and the sun for many days, and all hope was lost. They all thought, that's it, we're going to die out on the ship in the sea. But Paul knew they would get through. Okay? But goes to show how close to death they could get. In a night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Paul went through many, many trials. But I, what I wanted you to see here is that his trials were many and different everywhere he went meant went to uh, many places he was in many different types of situations but he says i was in deaths oft he was stoned he suffered shipwreck a night in the day and a day have i been in the deep that's awful a lot of people hate the ocean don't want to be in it and he floated in it for a night and a day. Terrible. But he got through it. So he was close to death many times. So was David. Take a look at what David said in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 3. And David swore moreover and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. Wow. Why don't you underline that in your Bible? Remember that statement from David. There is but a step between me and death. That's how close he felt to death. Not just one time, but constantly. Think about how he was chased around by King Saul who wanted to kill him. And he had to go from place to place in the wilderness, running here and running there. And that wasn't the end of it. All the death that he faced in fighting the battles, he, he faced death right in the face when he fought Goliath, ran right up to him and overcame. What about when his own son, Absalom, overthrew, usurped the throne of the kingdom? Didn't know what was going to happen then. Many times, David was a, 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 but a step away from death. But you know what? He accomplished a lot for God. When speaking about how Paul was constantly faced with death, he says that he is following the example of Christ and glorifying Christ. Let's read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. We are troubled on every side yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, 
that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. And then I want you to add this cross-reference uh, to, you know, when it said that phrase, always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, cross-reference that phrase with this. Galatians 6, 17, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Think about that. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? The marks of his suffering of his crucifixion, of that death and that suffering. He bears in that in his body. What does he mean? He, what does he mean? He means that he's following the example of Christ in suffering and facing death. What does he say? Bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We are always delivered unto death. Death worketh in us, constantly facing death all the time, but he has fully embraced it. He has accepted it. That is a part of the, the deal when he chose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That he was going to have to face death many times. And he's okay with that. Fear of death. All right. So let's talk about this. Fear of death. This is the first thing we're going to talk about in, related, in relation to this subject. Because people fear death. And, and what does that do? It's not the fact that people just fear death. It's that the fear of death stops people or hinders people from doing things that they maybe should be doing. Because they're scared that, well, if I do that, then I might die. Someone might get mad at me. Someone might want to kill me. That's correct. They might. If you follow Jesus Christ, there absolutely are people in this world who will want to kill you. That is a fact. And it always has been a fact of Scripture all through history. And it is still true to this day. People just hear the name Jesus Christ and they can start foaming at the mouth. I mean, not literally, but they're extremely angry. Okay? They absolutely hate it. Hate everything to do with the Bible, and you can see this rising more and more everywhere. The hatred increasing. But the question is, are you going to let that stop you? Because you fear death? Well, that's the great question, isn't it? And that's why the times that we live in is going to be a great separator. And it's going to separate the fake from the true. And one of the ways that that will happen is through the threat of death, the fear of death. Many will shrink back. Many will be ashamed of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ because they fear death. And you know what? That's a good thing. Because we need less fakes professing the name of Christ. And we need the real ones to shine forth as examples of the grace of God and as testimonies of the power of God and of salvation in Christ. And we need less of the fakes. It's muddying the waters. It's hard to even, no one even knows. What's true or what's not anymore? It's all unclear. So let's talk about the fear of death. Paul the Apostle did not fear death. Everywhere you turn and you see what he did, he shows no fear of death. Paul regarded service to Christ higher than preserving his own life. Let's read it. Acts chapter 20, verse 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, saying, I don't care. 
that prison awaits me in affliction. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know at least that. Then he says what? Neither count I my life dear unto myself. I don't care if I even lose my life. That's not what's the most important thing to me. The most important thing in my life is not preserving my life. It's what? Well, he says, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. His most important priority in life is to testify the gospel of the grace of God. To spread the gospel, to do the will of God, to do what is pleasing to God. That's his highest priority not preserving his life. So he doesn't make decisions based off of, ooh, if I do that, if I obey God, I might be threatened with death. He doesn't think about that. Now, I'm not saying he goes around making dumb decisions. Obviously, he avoids death if he can. You know, like in Ephesus when they were shouting, great is dying of the Ephesians and all that stuff. He went to go into the theater and they said, hey, don't go in there. They probably would have tore him apart. So yeah, th- I mean, that would have been dumb to walk in there. Not going to make foolish decisions and tempt God, but at the same time, not going to let the fear of death stop him from doing the will of God. Paul said the same thing about Epaphroditus. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 30. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Epaphroditus got sick. How did he get sick? Because he was working so hard in the ministry and he got sick because he just, he was just worn down, right? But he says he not regarding his life, meaning he was so focused on these other things, spiritual things that he didn't regard his life. And you know what it says in the book of Revelation about the saints that overcame? The saints in Revelation who overcome the devil loved not their lives unto the death. Look at it. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. That's how they overcame the devil. Okay? So you need to remember that. This is for, again, this is always true in every age, you know, in all the past history of of Christianity, but it is especially true for now, for the end times, for what it says happens with saints in the book of Revelation. The blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. Okay? So they're saved by the blood of the Lamb. They know about it. They understand from Scripture about the importance of the blood of Jesus Christ and how that paid for their sins. It talks about the word of their testimony. They give their testimony. They tell people the gospel and say, this is how Jesus Christ saved my soul. He can save you too if you just repent and believe the gospel. Here it is. They overcome by those things. And also that is tied together directly with that is that they love not their lives unto the death. You can't cut that out from the preaching of the gospel, by the word of their testimony, by the blood of the Lamb. You can't cut that out and separate it. The attitude of loving not their lives unto the death has to go with the blood of the Lamb, with the word of their testimony, if they are to be overcomers. If you want to overcome the devil, you have to have that attitude of loving not your life unto the death. Because you will be threatened with death. Just think about the mark of the beast. Think about the image of the beast. Said, okay, bow down, uh, worship the image of the beast, or you'll be killed. Well, you can't obey that. God expressly forbids you from doing that. So you can't love your life unto the death if you want to obey God in that instance. There it is. Not loving your life unto the death means you fear God more 
than the threats of physical death from men. You know, Jesus talked about this very clearly in the Bible. Luke chapter 12, verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. See, Jesus is so clear about this. Do not be afraid of people that kill your body, that can kill you, and that threaten to kill you. Don't be afraid of them. And after that, no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Who is that? Who is that that has power after he has killed to cast you into hell? Well, that's God. God has that power. And so he is telling you, fear God more than mere humans who can just kill your body and then do nothing else. Simple as that. And Jesus tells you that plainly. Okay? So the fear of God is very important when it comes to talking about overcoming the fear of death. Paul strove to magnify Christ, and if it meant by his death, then he embraced that. Okay, so he, he strove to magnify Christ in everything that he did. And if it meant by his death, then he embraced that. Okay, well, that's what I have to do. Paul saw death as a doorway to be with Christ and desired it, but saw his service here as more important. That's what he says right here in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Okay, that was his goal. Magnify Christ in his body, whether it be by life or by death. Magnifying Christ. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Didn't sound like he was afraid of death. In fact, he said to die is gain. A good thing because he know he knows that he would be with Christ if he died but if I live in the flesh this is the fruit of my labor yet what I shall choose I wot not for I am in a strait betwixt two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ which is far better he's admitting to you yes it would be far better for me to go to heaven to die be with Christ in heaven yes that's far better Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So he did not only did he not fear death, he said death was is actually far better than staying here in the flesh as far as what he would want to do. But he said, you know, God wants me to stay here in the flesh so that he says it's more needful for you. You guys need help. I need to continue preaching, helping to plant churches and go on and check on all the churches and all that stuff. There's still a lot more work that needs to be done before I can go be with Christ. But he says, hey, when I die, that's far better than being here. To die is gain. And Christ shall be magnified no matter what happens, whether by my life or by death. Paul wrote that the attitude of saints should be that we belong to God and so we should not be attached to the outcome of service to God. Whether we live or die is not supposed to be the concern, but whether we are pleasing God or not. Okay, so think about that. Instead of thinking about, you know, being so concerned and worried about whether you're going to live or die, you should be worried about, are you pleasing God or not? That should be the number one thing you're thinking of. Am I pleasing God with what I'm doing? And you have that attitude because you belong to God. If you're saved, you are a child of God. You are adopted by God into his kingdom as his children. You belong to him. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. 
And so you should want to please God. And so you don't care whether you live or die when you're serving God. Romans 14, 7. For none of us liveth to himself. You're not supposed to live your life for yourself. And no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord. Doesn't matter whether we live or die, we belong to God. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter if the saved person is still alive or if they have, or they have died. He is still their Lord, and they will rise again one day. But So it doesn't matter whether you live or die. What matters is you belong to God, and therefore your concern should be pleasing God. That's what you should um, be thinking about. Paul's firm belief in the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the righteous took away his fear of death and drove him to suffer as Christ did, even unto the death, if necessary. Because of his firm belief in the resurrection, it took away his fear of death. All right, let's look. Uh, Philippians 3.10, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Okay, so he's talking about Jesus Christ and saying, knowing the power of his resurrection... Okay, the power of the resurrection of Christ and identifying with that. And that could be, you know, multiple different ways. First of all, when you are saved, he, Paul said this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Talking about that resurrection life. Put off the old man, put on the new man. Okay, so the old man is crucified, but the new man is resurrected. We are buried, it says, and risen with Christ. So when you are born again, you have that new man that is res- that's partaking of the resurrection power of Christ. But then also, there is the belief and the knowledge that there will be a resurrection in the future of the righteous where you will receive a new body like Christ's. That's the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings fellowshipping, following after the pattern of suffering like Christ, even to being made conformable unto his death, even unto his death if necessary, dying like he did. And here's another one, 2 Corinthians 6, 9. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. Well, how, how can it be that we are as dying and behold we live? Because... Even if we physically die, we shall live eternally. And one day we will have, we will partake of that resurrection. And the dead in Christ will rise and live forevermore. That's how we can die and yet live. And Paul knew that. And and with this firm belief in the resurrection, it took away his fear of death and drove him to suffer. Uh, for a good cause. One of the effects of the death of Christ is deliverance from the fear of death. Okay, so think about this. Look at the scripture. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So talking about Jesus Christ, that through death, through the death of Christ, ready? That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, okay? So the fear of death, it says here, brings people into bondage, slavery. You become a slave, you can become a slave to the fear of death. It controls your actions. Many people's actions are controlled by the fear of death. There's some, you know, super creepy elite people out there with a lot of money and they fear death and so you know what they try to do they try to spend millions of dollars coming up with life extension technology putting weird gross stuff on their face including blood they want to live longer why they fear death 
They might not admit that, but they do. They want to live a long time, maybe even forever if they could. And so it makes them a slave and affects every decision that they make. And it can affect yours too. If you fear death, you're a slave to that. And instead of making a good decision, one that where you say, okay, should I make this decision? Okay, well, instead of saying, does this decision please God or not? You think of, oh, but what if I might die? What if someone might get mad and want to kill me because I, you know, I did something for Jesus Christ? Well, now you're making a decision based on the fear of death. Now you're a slave to that fear. But you know what it says? Jesus Christ died. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead. And it says, through death, he can deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The death of Christ frees from the slavery to the fear of death. That's one of the fruits of salvation in Christ. That when you're saved, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, and you're born again, then you are delivered from that fear so that you think, you know what? I don't care what happens. All I care about is doing what is pleasing to God because I love God. I want to do what God wants me to do, and I don't care what happens as a result. Well, that, that means you're free. That means you're walking in freedom. Freedom from the fear of death. And that is one of the many fruits and benefits of salvation in Christ. Now we'll talk about love and death. Love casts out fear, including the fear of death. It says it plainly in the Bible. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. All types of fear, by the way, because fear of torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Okay, so perfect love casts out fear. Well, how do you get perfect love? That's only from God, right? So again, you have to repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And it says, the love of God is shed abroad into our hearts by the Holy Ghost. So that's that perfect love. You can only get that when you, you're saved, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And then when you get that perfect love, you know what it says? It casts out fear. Many types of fears, including the fear of death. Cast it out. Love casts out fear. That's the power of love. You might have been taught about the fake, ushy-gushy Disney love which tells you to follow your heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It also says he that trusts in his own heart is a fool. Fool. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about true biblical love which comes from God. And it says that love has the power to cast out fear. And I believe that 100% because it is a statement in the word of God. It is a promise. And we should not doubt the truth of that statement, that perfect love, casts out fear. It absolutely does. Okay? That's the power of the love of God. Having the love of God and knowing that death cannot separate you from the love of God helps to face death without fear. That's exactly what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8. Let's look at it. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? No one and nothing can separate us. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And that's what Christians have had to face through many centuries facing death persecution where they slaughtered people like when the roman catholic church came to the village of the waldensians and said they said oh you know what if there are some christians in there and he said kill them all let god sort them out god knows his own and they wipe out villages of thousands of the waldensians they killed many christians 
it, it, you know, many different groups have. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter, facing death. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors, even when facing death. For I am persuaded that neither what? Death. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Not even death. And so if you know that deep down in your heart, you believe, because it says it right there, right? You either believe that or you don't. You either believe that statement from the word of God and you have faith. You say, yes, God, I believe that that's true. You believe that death cannot separate you from the love of God. Then that means you will not fear death. And that perfect love will cast out the fear of death. Because you have the love of God and you know you won't be separated from the love of God. Who shall separate you from the love of God? No one and nothing, including death. The Bible also says love for others overcomes the fear of death. Love for others overcomes the fear of death. True love will sacrifice self for the benefit of others when required. Not saying someone needs to always needs to do that, but sometimes it happens. It's necessary. And you know what the Bible says? Right here. John 15, 12. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. The Bible says that there is no greater expression of love in existence than someone laying down their life for their friends, for someone else, sacrificing their life for someone else. Now, the greatest instance of this in history that ever happened and ever will is what Jesus Christ did for us. He laid down, he chose to lay down his life for us. He gave it all up for us. The just for the unjust sacrificed himself so that we could be forgiven of our sins to be justified that we could be given the gift of eternal life that we could be washed in the blood of the lamb he gave his life laid it down for us now we are given that example to follow as an example the greatest example of what it means to love well guess what if you lay down your life for someone else out of love you have overcome the fear of death through love sacrificial love when you sacrifice yourself for someone else out of love there is no concern about death in that equation there is no thought of the fear of death the only thing that love sees is someone needs help and I'm gonna do it if I lay down my life, then they'll be saved. There is no thought that enters their brain about, yeah, but what if I die? That's not the concern. Death is not their concern. It's about doing what is right. It is about love. Not about death. Death should not stand in the way of doing what is right. Another great example of this is Esther, the Old Testament. Esther embraced the possibility of death out of love for her people when she went to make a request of the king. Okay, so what happened here is is that this wicked man named Haman made up a plan to have all the Jews in the land killed, destroyed. And Esther 
had one last chance to stop this plan. And she had to face death in order to stop this. So let's look at it. Um, Esther chapter 4, verse 10. Again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death. Okay, so what she's saying to Mordecai is, hey, you know, uh, if I go in unto the king, doesn't matter who it is, if I'm not called, you know, the law is that I should be put to death, that I'm going to be killed. Anyone that does that, they're supposed to be put to death. Except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. That's the only way that you won't die. But I have not been called to come into, under the, uh, into the king these 30 days. Okay, In a month, she hasn't been called in. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Wow. So Mordecai wasn't having any of Esther's excuse here. She said, well, I haven't, you know, he hasn't called on me to come in in 30 days. And if I come in without being called, I can be put to death. Mordecai says, listen, if you stay quiet now, and you don't do anything, God will find some other way to deliver his people. No matter what, God is going to deliver his people. So, even if you just keep your, your, your mouth shut, they're going to be delivered no matter what. But if you do, you and your family are going to be destroyed. That's what's going to happen if you keep your mouth shut and you don't take action here. So, do you think that Mordecai cared about the excuse of death here? No, he didn't care. He said, it doesn't matter. You need to do what's right right now to step in and intercede for your people. And who knows if you're come to the kingdom for such a time as this. God placed you there at this time, at this place, for this reason, to deliver his people. And listen to what she says. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. And neither eat nor drink three days, night and day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. If I die, then I die. Fine, I accept that. And that at that moment, Esther had embraced death. She accepted it. That it was more important for her to do what was right than to worry if she would die. If I perish, I perish. And that should be all of our attitude. That should be our motto. If I perish, I perish. Oh, well, I'm going to do what is right no matter what. Especially in an important life or death situation like this, where all these people were going to be killed, her people, but she had a chance to, to intervene and to possibly stop it. So getting past that fear of death, and, by, and guess what happened? She went and went to go talk to the king. He pointed his scepter at her and he allowed her to speak. And, you know, she set up a feast. She told him what was going on. Told, uh, told him that it was Haman. And then Haman was put to death on the gallows that he made for them. For Mordecai. Okay? 
So, you know, there it was it ended up well. But the point is is she had to get past that fear of death first. Okay? Now Oh yeah, the last point is why did she do that? Love for God and love for her people. Again, this is another instance of love overcoming the fear of death okay so i just wanted to emphasize that the importance of love overcoming the fear of death let's continue trusting god instead of self when faced with death paul gave up all confidence in himself and his ability to save himself and gave it all up to god we're going to read about that in a second paul specifically says god which raiseth the dead emphasizing the importance of the belief in the resurrection when faced with death. Let's look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Okay, so let's look at this. Paul's talking about, again, the, all these trials that they're going through, right? Remember before he talks about in deaths, oft, all these things. Well, here again, he says, we were going through trouble in Asia. We were pressed out of measure. We despaired even of life. That we were going to die. But we had this sentence of death in ourselves. It was a dying of self, right? Why? Because we should not trust in ourselves, but in God. All trust and confidence in ourselves melted away. Because we could not save ourselves. We could not deliver ourselves out of that situation. And so all confidence in ourselves was destroyed. It was gone. We had to give it up. But we had to put our trust in God. And he doesn't say just, he doesn't just say God. He says in God, which raiseth the dead. Again, it is connecting it to, he's connecting God to the resurrection. To belief in a future resurrection. Because, you know, since he has hope in that, it helps him to get through that situation of, of when he was facing death. It says, we trust in that God, the God which raises the dead. And, you know, this happens many times in the Christian life. Faith in God and his promises, especially about the resurrection, helped Paul get through the trials of facing death. God often puts us in a place where there is no other way out except by faith and giving it all up unto God. God will put you in that situation. If you're saved, don't be surprised if that happens. Where you feel like this, like you're pressed above measure. You feel like, I can't, I can't get out of the situation. I don't know what I'm going to do. Have you ever said that? Oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. What am I going to do? That's a great place to be. You know why? Because it's everything that has to do with you is all going out the window. All chance of you being able to save yourself, to be saved by the arm of the flesh is gone. And the only option you have left is to trust and have faith and cry out to God that God will deliver you. Only him. That's where he wants you to be. And, by the way, that's how your faith grows. God will put you in that place to grow your faith. Absolutely. And you feel like maybe even you're in a situation like that where you feel like you might die. Or maybe you are, did get close to death. And maybe God is bringing you close to death right now. He's making you knock on death's door so that you'll cry out to him 
and every bit of self-confidence and self-reliance will will be thrown out the window and you'll cast yourself upon God and say, God, I can't do anything. Without you, I can do nothing. I need you and you alone to pull me out of this. Nothing else I can do. I give it all up unto you. That's where he wants you to be. It's exactly where he wants you to be. My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Give it all up unto him. Now, Final section, the Lord Jesus Christ, death and obedience. Christ embraced death as part of his obedience. Okay? He embraced that. Christ came to the earth and he perfectly obeyed the law. Okay? He obeyed. Perfect obedience. And embracing death was a part of that because that was the end of his obedience right everything in his life of obedience was leading up to that moment of death that was the final act of obedience of christ was death willingly laying down his life he embraced it he embraced it before he even left heaven to be incarnated he had already embraced death and the cross on which he died is a symbol of death let's look at it philippians chapter 2 verse 5 let this mind be in you which also which was also in christ jesus who being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god he's equal with god he is god manifest in the flesh but made himself of no reputation took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and be and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient right it says and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross notice how it says death then it says death of the cross Okay, so obedience is connected to death. Obedience unto death. Embrace that death. That was the final act of obedience. But it says the death of the cross. Because the cross is a symbol of death. Now, why am I saying that? I'll tell you why. Uh, One more passage and then I'll explain more. The joy that was set before Christ of knowing that his sacrifice would provide the means for the salvation of souls was a motivator to endure the suffering of the cross even unto death. Okay, that was a motivator. Let's look at it. It says it right here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Look at it. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. It says he endured the cross How? For the joy that was set before him. He knew what was on the other side of that cross, on the other side of death. What was on the other side of that? Death of the cross. Victory over death. The gift of salvation. And that was joy. A reason to rejoice despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds okay so he knew what would happen after the death that's why he embraced the death you see that so if you see something there is a greater good again of doing right of pleasing God there is a joy in that joy is a fruit of the spirit right there is a joy 
in knowing that, hey, when you obey God and you do what is right, there is a joy in pleasing God and the joy of the fruit of that. And so through that joy, it can help you to endure painful things, suffering, tribulation, and trials and afflictions because of the joy of knowing that you're doing the right thing. And that joy that uh, Christ saw was so powerful, it, it drove him to go all the way to death for all of our sins. Now, let's apply this to us. Jesus preached multiple times that his followers should take up their cross. Right? We know that, right? He said, take up your cross, take up your cross. Taking up the cross is explicitly an embrace of the possibility of death. It's exactly what it is. Okay? Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever... Now, listen. You could take that out of context, right? You could say, oh, just take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And you could say, see, following Christ is about denying yourself, right? And every day you take up your cross because you deny yourself, and there's afflictions, and you follow Christ, right? And you could just apply it to that. Now, of course, it is associated with taking up your cross is associated with denying of self. But what does it say in the next verse? For whosoever will for. Well, if it says for, doesn't that mean it's connected to the verse that we just read previously? Yes. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Explicitly says, right after take up your cross, he starts talking about losing your life. For Christ. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. And it doesn't matter, right? If you gain the whole world but lose your soul, that's a pretty bad deal. It doesn't matter if you have everything in the world and lose your soul. If your soul goes to hell, what does it matter? And so he talks about uh, losing your life for his sake, right? So that is explicitly an embrace of death. Embracing death as a possible consequence of following Jesus Christ. He warns everyone right up front. Tells them. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and he said to them all, If any man, if any man, anyone, will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So, the cross of the, the disciple represents self-denial, of course, and death to everything that is contrary to the will of God. Let's look at this. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I into the world. The cross represents death to everything that is opposed to God. To be dead to the world and the world dead to me. Why? Because the world appeals to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And we should be dead to that. We are dead to that, and it's dead to us through the cross of Christ. Represents death. Taking up the cross means following the Lamb wherever he leads, even unto death if so required. Revelation 14.4, what does it say about them? These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Shouldn't that be us? Don't we want to follow the Lamb wherever he goes? Of course. Well, didn't he just say that earlier? He said, 
if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Well, if you want to follow Jesus, you know people love to put that in their profile. You know people love, I know I've said this a bunch of times, but I'm going to say it again. People that put follower of Christ in their social media profile. I'm a follower of Christ. Do they also talk about denying themselves and taking up their cross? as the the part of the package deal of being a follower of Christ. Because if you follow Christ, you have to take up your cross. There's no such thing as following Christ and not taking up his cross, your cross. It's not possible. And like I said, it involves, yes, denying yourself every day, being crucified to the world, the world crucified unto you, Submitting yourselves to God, resisting the devil that he flee from you, right? Fleeing from temptation of the flesh of the devil in the world every day, right? Yes, absolutely includes that. But it also includes the potential that you may have to die one day or deny your faith. And you know, Jesus said, whosoever will be ashamed of me in my words, I will be ashamed of him for my father so yes the cross represents death and you take up that cross you're saying I'm ready I'm taking up the cross I am willing to follow Christ wherever it leads including where he went where was the end for Christ in this world death that was the end of his obedience that's where we should be willing to follow him to the cross God views the death of all his saints as precious in his sight. Psalm 116.15 Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's not a small thing to God when his saints die. When they die in service to him. When they do not deny him. All the way till death. It is precious in his sight. He appreciates it and that's good to know that it's all the suffering and even if it's unto death is not in vain God sees it all and you will have rejoicing in heaven and you will hear that saying well done thou good and faithful servant and that's what you want to hear now let's end on this victorious Note and talk about the death of death. One last motivator in facing death is knowing that one day death will die. Defeated and conquered by Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 25. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That's right. One day, death will be destroyed. Will be no more. And when you know that, that one day death will die, that it will be destroyed, then you, then you will know that, hey, even if you die here, it's not going to last forever. It's only temporary, right? If you, you're saved and you die, to, get, to die is gain. You will be with Christ. And then death will be destroyed. And so you keep that in your heart. Furthermore, all saints will rejoice in this victory when we receive our new glorified bodies, which will never die. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Death is swallowed up. One day it will be swallowed up. And what happens? What does it mean when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality? That will be the new body. 
One day when the dead in Christ shall rise, we will all have new bodies that will never die and will not have a flesh, a sinful nature in them. No corruption. And we'll, we will be like Christ, it says. Putting on incorruption. And that will be a great day of victory. And so we should remember this promise. Keep that in our hearts. And again, that will help you to not be afraid of death now. Because you know what will happen one day. Death will be swallowed up in victory. And so with this hope, we walk without fear with death by our side. I hope that was a blessing to you. Thanks for watching and listening. Please like, share, and subscribe, especially subscribe to the Telegram feed where you get all the updates and the PDFs of the notes and uncensored news, and you'll find me there if I get censored anywhere else. And thank you for um, all the prayers, all the comments, and everything, all the gifts, and everything else. God bless you, and have a good day.